Oh, my niece is on. Oh, hey, Jess. Is. How you doing? Here, Ab Abby, go ahead and unmute Jess so she can at least say hi to How are you? Go. I'm good. It's so nice to see you. This good is her fourth you. Zoom call tonight. That's <laughs> Feel free to drop out anytime. Okay. <laughs> Jess, where are you? What part of the country? I'm in New York. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. It's, so. it's been one of the silver linings to our virtual programming and, and this experience is we've been drawing people from all over the country and even all over the globe, depending on time of day and time zone and what the event is. So where our JCC used to only be able to service San Diego and even at that, we struggled to get beyond greater La Jolla area. Now we have, we were bi-coastal uh, and hitting plenty of people in between too. So thanks for joining us, Jess. Yeah. And I want to welcome everybody else now too. Good evening and welcome to the virtual programming of the Lawrence Family JCC Jacobs Family Campus. Tonight's event is a presentation of the San Diego International Jewish Film Festival. My name is Ryan Isaac. I am the Director of Cultural Arts at the San Diego Center for Jewish Culture, which is part of our JCC. I hope everybody is happy and doing well and feeling strong. Uh, and just our, our daily reminder here, as long as we are all inside and working to flatten the curve, uh, we will be here, the JCC will be here to provide virtual entertainment. So thanks again for joining us. Keep in mind, especially for Zoom newbies, uh, we can see some of you and it's wonderful to do so. Uh, just keep in mind you can be seen. Uh, and uh, that's about it. We're, we're excited to, to bring you some more events as well. This Sunday, a couple of new times, a little more friendly for you, Jess, back east. At 3 p.m., we have artist Debbie Mueller. Uh, Debbie uh, found her way to us actually through Abby, Abby McCarthy, who's part of our JCC staff. Uh, Debbie is a painter, uh, but she came to art late in her life. She's actually an OBGYN and has been in the medical world for a long time and only recently discovered her artistic talents and passions. So I think she'll be painting for us and also discussing that newfound passion and balancing it with, uh, with her day job. And next Tuesday, April 21st, we have a wonderful event, uh, Modern Loss, which is a book that was written by two women, Rebecca Soffer and Gabrielle Berkner. Uh, they will be joining us to discuss uh, grief, grieving and loss in general, and especially in these times. And I think what they're going to be able to do is provide many of us with tools to cope and uh, stay mentally strong and help, help ourselves, help each other, and create a, a network and, and some support through that. So we're excited to have them. We're fortunate to have them. Uh, also fortunate tonight to have James Friedman. Uh, James is a longtime friend of the Lawrence Family JCC. In 2013, his first documentary, Glickman, <coughs> at our JCC as part of the mid-season uh, screenings. And in 2019, at the film festival, his more recent piece, Lemley, which is a uh, documentary of Carl Lemley, founder of Universal Pictures and a man whose impact in the world and in Jewish culture extends well beyond just that. Uh, that was, that's his most recent uh, piece and we're going to talk about that some tonight. Uh, James has, is in LA. He's been in entertainment and writing for a while. Uh, his writing credits include uh, Sybil as well as Coach. Thank you, James. Spent a lot of late nights watching Coach on syndication. <laughs> Help me go to bed. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to introduce James. Thank you for being here. How are you? I'm good. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I hope you're all staying uh, safe and somewhat sane. And uh, clearly you're bored because you've come here tonight, but that's okay. Yes. So... How, how, first of all, how are you doing? How is LA? You, you made one interesting comment to me earlier when we were speaking before this started. The air has never been cleaner. No, it's paradise here. The air is so clean and pristine and you go out for walks or runs and, and it's beautiful. Um, but uh, not at this cost, but it's, it's beautiful. Before the stoppage and before we get into Lemley, 
any project you were working on? Has anything been interrupted professionally for you? Uh, yes, I don't like talking about things till they're out okay. in the marketplace, but yes, the answer is yes. Okay. So, uh, so I had just about gotten the rights to something that I was working on. And there's another project I'm also working on and, uh, you know, whichever the financing comes through first, that's the one I'll do. But, uh, yeah, it's very frustrating, but listen, who doesn't have huge problems right now, no matter what you're doing, you know, it's a, it's a new world right now temporarily. But I, I do want to say this. My sister-in-law is a uh, pandemics expert. Uh, she's a doctor at UCLA. And, um, you know, the th she's been advising uh, Gavin Newsom and uh, Mayor Garcetti. And the one thing she always says, and I learned a little bit about this because in the film Lemley, I had to research the 1917-1918 uh, Spanish flu influenza uh, pandemic. But pandemics, they end. They will end. And it's kind of hard to keep that in perspective right now, but they will end. It probably will be longer than any of us would like, but uh, that's the thing I always, you know, cling to. It's, this is not a permanent thing and it's not the rest of our lives. You know, things will be very different, obviously, when we go back into the world a little bit for a while, um, but it, it'll get back to a, a real semblance of what we knew how long that is, nobody knows. But, you know, once they get a vaccine, you know, things are very different again. Do you think that once there is a vaccine, the film industry in particular will be able to return to business as usual? And I do. I, I tend to be optimistic, but I absolutely do. There'll be very different uh, rules and regulations. I, I wonder if the handshake will ever come back for anybody uh, or hugging or, you know, strangers or whatever. But, uh, I, I do think it will come back and it will make us all very aware of, of this. So hopefully it, it doesn't happen again, or if it does happen again, we're a lot more prepared. You know? I'm not going to ask you to speak about your, your current projects. I do want to know though, if in this time, are you able to devote more energy towards those projects than you otherwise would no. have? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd be lying if I said that. No, there's a lot to do. Um, I have not been working as hard as I normally work. And, you know, that'll start to increase soon. But it's just very difficult because you don't know. You know, I could get the go-ahead on something three, four months down the road. But you don't know that someone would agree to let you come to their house and film them and interview them. So it's that part's stagnating right now. But I'm researching and, and it'll, I'll, I'll start to pick it up as, as this seems to have some end in sight. But right now, it's just sort of hunkering down with the family and, uh, you know, doing a little bit of work. Good. Well, let's talk about your most recent work then, with Lemley. And I, I found the, the theme, the constant between your two documentaries, the two subjects, Glickman and Lemley, both uh, under-praised titans and, oh, and, and yeah. heroes where, where there, once, once you hear about the story, you realize it had to be told. With, with Lemley, what was your introduction to him? And how did that come together where you, you decided this was a story you had to tell? <clears throat> I had just finished my first film, which for any of you uh, uh, who are interested, was called Glickman. Uh, it was exec produced by Martin Scorsese, and it was about Marty Glickman, this great uh, New York sportscaster who was one of two Jewish Olympic sprinters who was not allowed to run in the 1936 Olympics because American officials who were Nazi sympathizers were trying to play Kate Adolf Hitler. And uh, that was my first film. And after I had finished that, I was ready to do another film. And the company I was doing it for shuttered their feature documentary division. Um, two weeks before I was scheduled to go back to New York and shoot interviews. So I kind of lost six months of my life. And I was like, I went on the internet. I'm looking at anything I can find. Can I find a new idea? And I came across this, I, I came across this article about a thing called the trust wars. And I'm a film buff. I had never heard of this. And it was basically Thomas Edison had been uh, attempting to monopolize the film industry through patents. 
And there was this little German immigrant named Carl Lindley. And he fought Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison actually sued him something like 289 times and Lemley won every single lawsuit. And that's how Edison was beating these people and getting a monopoly. And I said, I never heard of this guy. Who is? So I Googled him again and I read how uh, in 1934, he had made a film at Universal called Imitation of Life. He created Universal uh, Studios and Universal City, Carl Lemley. And uh, Imitation of Life was about in part, what it's like to be black in America in 1934. That's five years before Gone with the Wind. And I Googled him again and I saw he had hired, uh, he had 11 full-time women directors uh, working on the lot at Universal. And that's an issue very much in the zeitgeist. And he was way ahead of the curve with that because so many uh, men had gone off to war in World War I. So he said, well, they can direct. And in fact, the highest paid uh, director on his lot was a woman, Lois Weber, who for film buffs, she was a very famous, one of the early women pioneers. Um, by the way, if anyone wants to see Glickman who has not seen it, you can see it on iTunes, you can rent it or buy it or on Amazon. And it's just called Glickman. Um, and uh, I think you'll like it. Uh, Lemley right now is not uh, distributed. I've been talking to my sales rep, but obviously the coronavirus hit and that sort of stopped everything. It's been playing all over the world at film festivals and that's obviously stopped for the time being. So hopefully by the summer, I'll know where it will land in terms of so people can see the film. Um, but anyway, I kept reading about this guy, Carl Lemley, and I read about all this stuff. And then I was completely blown away when I read that he saved over 300 Jewish families from Nazi Germany and fought our own US State Department to do it by writing affidavits and getting these people to come to the United States. And I said, I, I, this guy is an American hero. And I started asking my friends about him. I said, has anyone heard of this guy, Carl Lemley? And one guy said, didn't he have something to do with Dracula and Frankenstein? And I said, yeah, but people hadn't heard of him. And I said, how is this possible that this guy slipped through the cracks of history and the reason I made my first film, Glickman, I worked for Marty Glickman. And when I was in uh, film school uh, at Stanford, uh, I, someone once asked me, what's the best job you ever had? And I said, I once produced Marty Glickman's radio show on WNEW in New York. And they said, who's Marty Glickman? And it didn't occur to me that no one had heard of him hardly outside of New York. And so I said, I have to make a film about that guy. And I felt the same way about Lemley. And so I did. I mean, this guy, his life is unbelievable. I don't know how many of you have seen the film, by the way. I'm only seeing about uh, maybe 10 of your faces. The rest, I just see names. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if anyone has even seen Lemley. But uh, it, uh, hopefully I'll be able to get it to you by the summer. Um, but anyway, that's why I made the film. I, the guy's story needs to be told. And in fact, what better time than now to make a film about an immigrant who helped make America great? Fantastic. So in, in terms of the exposure it's had through film festivals now and that it's come to a bit of a stop, what was that like leading up to those final days and, and what what does the future look like for screening it at festivals? Well, it was great. I mean, uh, my wife and I, it's like our favorite thing to do for the weekend. You know, we went to Toronto and Chicago and New York and San Diego um, and uh, the film shows. And it, there is nothing like seeing a film with an audience. And I know it's going away and I know kids are watching films on their phones. And But to be in an audience, we had two screenings in L.A., one of the... Uh, Los LA Jewish Film Festival, where it actually won Best Documentary. I was very happy about that. And we had two crowds of 400 people each. And it's just something very powerful. It's like, that's what's great. That's what drew me to the movies to begin with. It's, I just love the movies. And I, I can't wait to when I can go back. And then a bunch of festivals have canceled, hopefully, when whether it will go online through the festivals, because I know a lot of art house companies are looking into showing their stuff online right now and or 
it actually is a theater and they find a way to separate people. I, I don't know how that will work, but uh, I believe it will go back, you know, on the festival circuit. Um, but who knows, you know, I, restaurants and movies, like and a lot of other industries, boy, are they going to get hit hard. You know, that's just, I, especially if things come into the house through streaming, you know, are people going to risk going to a theater? You know, we'll find out. Right. We'll find well, out. Well, back to Lemley and, and your process in creating the documentary and researching it. As you said, that most of your friends weren't even familiar with, with Carl Lemley. How deep did you dig? What, what kind of resources did you have? What was available to you? And, and how many times were you even surprised yourself as you kept digging? Oh, always. That's where I find the film. And I'm a research nut. I don't hire a research assistant. I wish I could make my life a hell of a lot easier. But um, I just research and research and research. And you find things. And I found some, uh, I interviewed two people that he had saved, because obviously they're very elderly now. Uh, and then the Shoah Foundation and Steven Spielberg's foundation financed a great deal of the film. But uh, the Shaw Foundation had three interviews with people that Lemley had brought over. So that was great to be able to have that. And then uh, Ron Meyer, uh, the head of Universal, uh, NBC Universal, uh, had loved my film Glickman. This is actually a cute story. I had not sold Glickman at the time to HBO. Scorsese had not gotten involved yet. Ron Meyer asked to see the film and I didn't know him and I gave him the film and I met with him and he said, listen, is there anything I can do to help you get this movie made or anything I can ever do for you, let me know. Well, the next day, Martin Scorsese got involved and so I didn't need Ron Meyer. Well, five years later, when I was doing Lemley and realized I needed all the universal footage and stills, I called him up and I said, uh, and he remembered me and I said, you remember how you said if there's ever anything you can do for me? And he said, yes. I said, well, there is. And he did. And so I had all the universal newsreels, all the stills. I must have had four or 5,000 stills to choose from. And uh, I also got the rights to a, a Lemley relative, gave me the rights to all the stuff she had. And uh, so I had, you know, a ton of material and there's, there's a whole other film on the cutting room floor, as I used to say. And who was it? Um, uh, 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 Faulkner, the, the writer, used to say, you have to be willing to kill your darlings. You know, there were a lot of darlings that were on the floor there. And you could actually make a whole other film because the guy's life was unbelievable. I mean, just if you just took that this little immigrant came to America and created Universal Studios and Universal City, or if you just took a guy who saved all these Jewish lives from Nazi Germany and these refugees, especially what's, what's going on today and still is going on today, <clears throat> either of those subjects would be a film. I try and find that. Like, Marty Glickman has two stories to it also. He was so, uh, you know, such a pioneer in sports broadcasting, specifically basketball, and he had the whole Olympic story where he was one of two Jewish runners who was not allowed to run. And in the history of the Olympics, he's the only, they're the only two American athletes who were healthy, who were denied a chance to participate in the Olympics. That's incredible. Uh, I, I do want to make one note I forgot to make earlier. As we are all friends here and in, enjoying our isolation together, uh, yes, there's Alyssa right there. This, this is a, a wine-friendly event. Uh, any, anybody's having a drink, don't, don't feel like it needs to be hidden. Um, we're, we're, we're all in this together. Uh, I'll just save my drink for about an hour or so from now. Uh, but, but otherwise, please, please feel free to, uh, to imbibe. Uh, this is water, not vodka, but I wish it were vodka. <laughs> James, it's hard to hear Scorsese references and not chase after that a little bit. What was it like working with him? What did you What did you learn being around him? I, I he came on after the film was finished, mm -hmm. and then it took nine months to actually get a phone call with him that was canceled like every month. Things and new, and uh, he had three notes, and I was able to take two of them, 
And I was so scared to say, I can't take your third note. I tried it. It's not working. He said, oh, it was just a suggestion. I like what you're doing. But the thing he did that was great for me is um, he, he got it through HBO on his deal at the time. But at the time, I had hired a very famous actor to do the narration. And there were problems with uh, 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 the SAG union. And I wasn't a, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, not a participant. I, I wasn't a signator. And they wouldn't allow me to be a signator because I'm not a big company. I'm one guy. And so uh, I had to do the narration myself. And when I, that's the first question I asked Scorsese. I said, you know, is HBO going to want to come in and bring in a big name guy to do the narration? Or are you okay? He said, no, no, I love your narration. It's great. And I realized it gave me a chance to add so much more of me to the film. So it's not directing an actor to say, no, could you emphasize that word in this sentence or have this kind of feeling? I knew what I wanted and I was able to do it. So on Carl Emley, I, I narrated and uh, I hope to always narrate my films because it's actually me telling the audience sort of what I feel about this moment and they can discard it or agree with it or whatever, but it, it's another avenue to get myself of what I want to say into the film. So that's the main thing he did for me. That's incredible, because I, I imagine the ownership you're able to maintain in telling your story is, is so heightened through that. Well, I had worked for many years on TV shows where you're one writer in a room of like 15 writers or whatever, and you're basically just a hired brain. I mean, there'd be some scripts with my name on them, on Sybil or Coach, whatever, where maybe I had one joke in the whole thing. And then there'd be other scripts. I wrote most of it. My name's not on it. It's just the nature of the beast. But you're really a hired brain. And, and sometimes you disagree with the finished product, even though it has your name on it, because you're not the showrunner. So this was an opportunity, for better or worse. It's like when I finished Glickman, I, I literally had drained myself so much making that film that I just said, if someone doesn't like this, I can't even get upset about it because this is the best I could do. This is the film I wanted to make. And it was so well received. I mean, you know, I uh, certainly never expected Martin Scorsese to see it and want to put it on. That was certainly, you know, uh, icing on the cake to say the least. But um, at least what's ever going out is exactly what I want. And if people don't like it, well, it's what I want. That's good. You had mentioned to me earlier that during these times you're retreating to the to comfort viewing. Yeah. And and I think it's an important part for everybody here just to be able to to unplug and decompress. What's what's on James's list of of comfort TV in pandemic? Uh, well, I watch a lot of old Columbo episodes. I love Columbo. Um, and it's so funny to see, you'll see a scene of like, you know, people all going to a buffet and putting their fingers. I mean, you look at everything so differently now and it was only a few months ago. Right. And I watch a lot of, uh, Turner classic movies. I love the old movies and, uh, double indemnity film noirs, comedies, great films. So I'm watching a lot of classic films and, uh, things like Columbo's and, and things like that, basically. Is there, are you able to step away from, from the work when you do that? Does it, does it provide that distance and separation for you? Well, great films do because you always see something new or you see a camera angle or you see something, you know, Billy Wilder's doing or uh, uh, you think about Billy Wilder, you want to be humbled. This guy, one could say, was probably the best director of his time who could do comedy and drama, Double Indemnity or Some Like It Hot. And this was in his second language. If you put me in another country, I couldn't make, do anything. <laughs> and so I, I have, I'm in such awe of people like that, you know, who are just so incredible. So that's kind of, uh, th that's the joy I get in it. You know, I don't, I couldn't, well, like when you're writing on a sitcom, which I did for many, many years, you can't watch another sitcom because it's just work and you're ahead of 
with the exception of a show maybe like Seinfeld at the time, you're ahead of uh, the jokes. What we are doing, another comfort thing, my uh, youngest son, who's a senior in high school, had never seen Curb Your Enthusiasm. So my wife and my eldest son and I, we all watch a couple of episodes every night. And he makes fun of everything. So a pandemic is no big deal. I mean, he did, you know, he's so politically incorrect. So that's been very enjoyable to just laugh and forget things. And I try not, I read the New York Times a lot. I try not to watch too much news. I have, uh, you know, it's, I don't think it's that healthy. I get the news of the day. I, I like listening to uh, what Cuomo has to say in New York or Gavin Newsom. I try and stay away from the 800 pound gorilla in the room, elephant in the room, keep my sanity. Yes, it's good, good advice for everyone. Yeah. Uh, so you, you started in sitcoms and you moved over to documentaries. Is documentaries where you see yourself remaining for a while? Oh yeah, uh, I, I, I love it. And you know, I, if I could also get a uh, scripted version of some of these subjects, I, I wouldn't be against that either. It's difficult to do, but uh, yeah, because you, you can sort of do it yourself to a degree and, and you don't need so many people. You, you need people, but it's not, you know, if you write a scripted show, you need hundreds of people. This you don't. What's the first step or what are the first couple of steps you take after you've done the research when you start putting, putting the script together? What's that like for you from the documentary standpoint? You know, I had no idea how to do it. And I got the best piece of advice I ever got from anyone about documentaries. A friend of mine is a documentary filmmaker. He wasn't even that close of a friend, but I had lunch with him and he said, you want to do what's called a radio edit. I said, what's a radio edit? He said, you get the transcripts of all the interviews you've done. Don't worry about, uh, there's a thing called B-roll. That's the stuff you're seeing on the screen if someone's not talking, footage or photos. He said, don't even think about that. Just think of it as it's a radio show. Just go and take the best quotes of each subject of, and, and just throw them in a, a file and then start to see if you can make an order of it. Like this would go at the beginning of it. I this is a thing I discovered that I think I'll always do if I can. I make my films like cinematic novels. So they all have chapters in them. And that allows me to do a two minute piece on something and then go back to the spine of the story in the next chapter, maybe do a seven or a 10 minute piece on that, and then do another short thing. And you can have some uh, humor in something and then go back to a very serious thing. And I find that it's easy for me to compartmentalize the different parts of the film that way. So I, I found something that works for me. And I think I'll always do it because I, people like it. You get to put a quote at the beginning of the chapter and then the audience doesn't really know what it means. And by the end of the chapter, they go, oh, I know what that means now. And I, I like that. It's kind of uh, gives a little intrigue to what you're doing. Yeah, that's... That's great insight. It's wonderful. And just want to put it out there for everybody with us. If you have a question for James, uh, you can either text it to us, chat it to us through, through the Zoom or raise your hand and uh, I'm happy to call on you and we'll, we'll give you the chance. Yeah. So when, when you are writing regularly, do you, do you have a routine that you follow? Is, is there scheduled out days for you or are you no I, I just I, what it's like once you realize what you want to do it's sort of you know you research you're researching and you're researching and then one day you realize you've come to the top of a mountain and it's a lot longer to go down the mountain than it is to just keep going forward and you're sort of stuck you got to go forward you got to finish it so I just work around the clock at that point and I'll write down a hundred things a day that need, all I see are things that aren't working. They're just not working. You, there are probably 10,000 things at the very beginning that aren't working. And I'll write down a hundred each day that I have to do. And maybe I do 10 of them, you know, working 15, 16 hours a day. And 
you feel so good when you cross off of now that's working. Okay, let's move on to this. And that's sort of how I work. So I just get obsessed with the material and the research and, and I try and the, what happens is you see something, you may see some footage and, or a still photo and your reaction to it, you might, let's say it's funny and you laugh. Well, by the time you're done making the film, you may have seen that clip one or 2,000 times. You, you can't laugh. It's, you don't even see the clip anymore. And so I try and remember my first reaction to something and write it down so I know I'm, it's going to grow stale on me, but the audience has never seen it and it's good. Don't lose faith in that. It's good. And, and that's sort of what I do and, and make sure... Oh, yeah. And then I'll have a rough cut and I'll show it to a dozen friends in the industry and let them rip it apart. And, and uh, never a fun process, but I trust my friends. And, and, um, and then I, you know, just make notes. And I, I'm uh, constantly trying to say the same thing in fewer words, you know, and, and make it more concise and, you know. You start to look at time very differently when you're making a film. So all of a sudden, you're making a film, 15 seconds is a chunk that, you know, is this really worthy of those 15 seconds? And, you know, it makes you really scrutinize what you're putting in the film. And does this belong there? And sometimes you have to cut. I had to cut a thing in Lemley that was really difficult to cut. Does anyone know the story of the SS St. Louis? It was called The Voyage of the Damned. Uh, I only see a few of you, but basically in 1939, a ship set sail from Germany headed for Cuba with over like a thousand Jewish passengers on board who were promised that they would be allowed into Cuba. And on the ship ride over, Joseph Goebbels uh, stirred up so much anti-Semitism, but by the time the ship landed, the Cuban government would not let them in. And so... Uh, Carl Lemley, who had uh, worked in Cuba when he was trying to escape Thomas Edison and uh, make sure of these silent films, he called up Cuban officials. He tried to talk, reason with them. He tried to bribe them and they came back asking for a million dollars a passenger in 1939 money, saying that's how absurd it was. So the ships turned around and headed for the United States and was three miles outside or two miles outside of Miami. They could see the palm trees. And uh, Lemley wrote a uh, telegram to FDR saying, you know, my power compared to yours is of that of a child. Won't you please let in these poor, you know, innocent suffering people? And 83% of the United States did not want Jews coming into the United States during a depression and taking away any jobs. So FDR knew this, he was a politician, so the ship was turned away. And with the exception, for the most part, of the people who were sent to England, you know, many people on that ship went back to Europe and died in the Holocaust. But Lemley tried to save these people. He was always trying to do this. And I love that. It just, it didn't fit where I wanted it to fit in the film. And when I took it out, the film just worked. And when it was in, the thing that came after it didn't work. And, and and so I couldn't believe if you, when I first came across that telegram, I had the, one of the original telegrams that Lindley wrote to FDR. I said, well, this is definitely going to be in the movie. There's no way this won't be. And it wasn't, you know, so that's sort of a little bit into the process. That's incredible. And yeah. certainly just great, great insight to what goes into it and what has to sometimes get let out, left out. It's a terrific story. I have a question from Charles Brown. He asked, was Marty Glickman an observant Jew? The film, which was great, didn't seem to explore whether he had a strong religious affiliation. He was very culturally Jewish, and he, ref and he was not uh, in the uh, temple every Saturday. But as he said, he was one of the people who didn't change his name. Back then, everybody changed their name. Jerry Lewis was Joseph Levitz. Uh, Dean Martin was Dino Crosetti. They wanted no ethnicity. And that was in the movies, the Jewish moguls wanted no ethnicity. Everyone came from Middletown, USA, you know. And uh, Marty said he could never 
uh, deal with the fact his father might be listening to a broadcast and hear him say, this is Marty Manning, instead of the Jewish name of Glickman. And in the movie, you see how he should have been, he was the original voice of the NBA, and he should have been as well known as people like Kirk Gowdy and Jim McKay and all these people. But because national broadcast, Howard Cosell was probably the first Jewish national broadcaster of fame that came across as Jewish. Like the Yankee announcer, Mel Allen, was really Mel Israel. And people didn't know this. So Marty was very proud of being Jewish and uh, which is, you know, more credit to him because he wasn't allowed to run because he was Jewish in the Olympics. That's the only reason he wasn't allowed to run. Great. James, you mentioned the Yankees and Alyssa's face lights up. I think she might have a question too. So uh, let's see. Hi, Alyssa. Hi, okay. Hello, how are you? Thank you so much for talking with us. Oh, I'm please. I'm a historian, and I've been doing a little work <clears throat> on Fox and Daryl Zanuck. Yes. You get to see Carl Emley at the festival. I'm looking forward to when you make it available for streaming. Um, while you were talking and about Lemley being obscure, I started <laughs> to get up and look in my office in the indexes, and I realized there are almost no references to Carl Lemley at all. I have only one book where he's even mentioned a few times. So my first question is, are, did he not leave archives? That might be harder for historians for Universal than someone like Zanuck, who has a boatload of stuff and gets talked about. But the second thing is I'd love to hear more about All Quiet on the Western Front and any stories you have about any troubles he might have had making um, what was such a controversial film at the time. Yes, considered one of the great anti-war films. There's a reason Lemley is not as well known as the other uh, moguls, one of which is he uh, lost his studio in 30, uh, 1936 and died in 1939, but his name was not on the studio. It was Fox, it was Warner Brothers, so they got all this uh, fame based just on people seeing their names up there. Um, he, there was an autobiography that he, uh, there's a German one written by Udo Baer that I read the transcription of, and that's really hard to read a German to English transcription of something. It's so dry. And then he commissioned a, a book on himself in 1920 or something by John Drinkwater, but it's a puff thing. It, it doesn't really, but there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of letters. There's a lot of, you know, but you have to really research that stuff to get it. But uh, I actually tried to get a book going about him, but we couldn't get a publisher interested because they didn't know who he was. And we were saying, look at his life, you know. In terms of All Quiet on the Western Front, that's a big part of, that's a big chapter in the film. Uh, Universal had mostly been known for making uh, cheap comedies and westerns. And then uh, they hit pay dirt with the silent monster movies or horror films of uh, Phantom of the Opera and Hunchback of Notre Dame. And then Junior Lemley, Carl's son, helped them do uh, Frankenstein and Dracula. And that's what they're really known for all over the world. Uh, I remember one time many years ago, I was in Yugoslavia working on a film that was called Yugoslavia. And I went into a little a disco and on the wall were Marilyn Monroe and a picture of Humphrey Bogart, John Wayne, and Frankenstein and Dracula. It's that iconic. So Lemley wanted to make All Quiet on the Western Front as his gift to the German people. He was very proud of being German. And that caused him a lot of problems. A lot of the film is about that. It's uh, in World War I, there was such anti-German uh, fervor in this country that it'd be the equivalent of a uh, Islamic fundamentalist running Disney, you know, like that, you know, people would be up in arms. So Lemley actually made anti-German films to keep his studio alive in 1918. But he wanted to make this movie as a gift to the German people. And it played all over Europe. And then in those days, and even today, when you have a film, it's got to pass the censor board of whatever country you're giving it to. So Germany, he, he had the German uh, uh, 
consul in San Francisco look at the film and give him notes, and then they agreed. But what happened was, this is an anti-war film. Hitler and Goebbels are trying to stir up the country. They're not even in power yet. They don't, he, Hitler is, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is 1930, remember. And here's an anti-war film. They're trying to militarize Germany. And they're, they're basically saying, the Jews betrayed our country, and that's why we lost World War I, not the ger brave German soldier. So they needed to have that film banned. And the very first showing of All Quiet on the Western Front in Germany, the police were out in force to stop, and the Nazis didn't show up, and everything was fine. The police let down their guard the next day, and Goebbels sent in... Uh, stormtroopers and, and the Hitler youth and mice and smoke bombs and they beat up uh, viewers they thought were Jewish and people were afraid to go to the theater to see the film. And they did get that film banned in Germany for many, many years, by the way. And uh, it was heartbreaking because Lemley could never go back to Germany after that. He was considered uh, persona non grata in Germany and an enemy of the people. And they were saying, look at these, Carl Lemley, the Jew made this film about how the German soldier is a coward. And, and really the film is about what happens to kids who are conscripted into the army against their will to have to fight in these awful conditions. And it's still, the film holds up. Steven Spielberg said uh, he used the, open, the fight sequences, the battle sequences, were a huge influence to him in Saving Private Ryan. They were directed by Lewis Milestone. A couple of other interesting things about that film. It was one of the first times there were two directors on that film. Lewis Milestone, who had been a silent director, and was great with visuals, and Lemley brought in a second director, who was George Cukor. Now, George Cukor went on to do Philadelphia Story and win many Oscars, and he... He was the dialogue coach. So they had him working with dialogue and Lewis Milestone doing the visuals. And somehow it worked. Usually that would be a recipe for disaster, but somehow it worked. And uh, the other story I remember from All Quiet on the Western Front is that uh, Carr was notorious for nepotism. And he had a friend who had a son named Fred who wanted to be in the movies. So Carl gave him a role uh, as an extra in All Quiet on the Western Front. And Fred turned out to be Fred Zinneman, the two-time Oscar-winning director who did A Man for All Seasons and uh, High Noon, and uh, just a great director, who ironically was fired from the film for not taking direction. So those are some stories from uh, All Quiet. By the way, um, for those who haven't seen the film, you can go on my website, carlemleythefilm.com and I have I think four clips from there the trailers there um, and you can also follow me on Twitter I constantly put up some fun stuff that I couldn't put in the film and that's uh, the Twitter feed is at carlemleyfilm uh, so those are great sources to learn about that but thank you for your question that's a terrific film that was great, Alyssa. James, those, those stories were terrific. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. I think Bryna has a question. Is that, there we go. Yeah. Hi, Bryna. Uh, hi. Uh, there are uh, a couple of other, well, I'm sure there's many more, uh, Berlin Olympics related stories that I haven't seen told and wondered if you were aware of. Uh, one is about Avery Brundage, and I forgot what his role was in the U.S. government. Um, he was the head of the U.S. Olympic Committee and then later the head of the uh, um, Worldwide Olympic Committee and a I, I, notorious anti-Semite. Right. And I think he had gotten construction contracts from Hitler. That's in Glickman. That's in my film. Right. Um, okay, good. I'll look forward to seeing that. Yeah. The other one, um, I actually interviewed Marty Glickman when the Hall of Champions opened in San Diego. Oh, great. And I don't remember if it was he who told me or someone else who was there, but they said a great story from that time that's never been told was about Eleanor Holm. Yes, yes. Okay. 
Eleanor yes. Holm was an Olympic champion swimmer from the 32 Olympics in LA. And she was very pretty. And Junior Lindley dated Eleanor Holm, by the way, um, for a little while. And uh, she's in Lindley. There's a quick shot of her in Lindley. Oh, really? Yeah. And in, uh, in, in Glickman, uh, I learned that Eleanor Holm, she was on the ship that set sail for Europe. Right. And she had some champagne. And Avery Brundage, who I had heard a story, had the hots for Eleanor Holm. And she turned them down. And so he threw her off the team because you're an amateur, you're not allowed to be drinking or whatever. And she got to Europe and I believe it was Hearst who hired her when she landed to be a correspondent for the Olympic games. So she ended up and uh, being in, you know, covering the Olympics. And uh, that's what I know about Eleanor Holm. I do know that uh, another story that has been told, it was a wonderful in uh, HBO documentary, Natalie Portman, I think, narrated it. It was on Gretel Bergman. Oh, and yeah. Here's, here's how the two stories tied together. Gretel Bergman, for those who don't know, was an Olympic sprinter, and she was called Hitler's Pawn. Germany, uh, the U.S. was thinking of boycotting the Olympics, and if the U.S. did not come to the 36 Olympics, Hitler's propaganda machine, it would have been a huge blow, and a lot of other countries might not have come as well. So to show that Germans were allowed to, German Jews were allowed to try out for the team, and she was the German Olympic uh, high jump champion. They, they had a place in Etlingen, Germany, which I actually lived in working on a film that never got finished in Germany, and I didn't know it at the time. They had like a potato field and they let these Jewish athletes, it was a, it was a joke, it was all a pretense. And they said, uh, she is on, you know, the team and so the u.s committed to going and the, the minute we set sail the germans cut her from the olympic team and so uh that was gretel bergman's story well it turns out that without knowing it i got a call when the film came out from her son who i had known 20 years earlier and we had lost touch with each other and that was his mother so then and this came after i finished Lemley. My friend's uh, cousin was Andrew Bergman, and Andrew Bergman was the writer director, is the writer director who did, he wrote The In Laws, that great film. He wrote uh, part of uh, uh, Blazing Saddles. He made, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank on one of his uh, stuff he directed, but he, he did just a terrific writer director. And uh, oh, he did The Freshman with Marlon Brando. And, Matthew Broder. And he was Gretel Bergman's nephew. And so I spoke to Andrew because I've been a huge fan of his. And I wish I had known about him when I was interviewing people. I would have absolutely put him in the film. And he just wrote an article about his father and that Lemley brought his father over with an affidavit. Oh, wow. So it all came full circle. And it's like, those are the stories. We, we had a screening in New York. Uh, over a year ago, and we brought in uh, all the descendants of the people Carl Lemley saved that could make it to the screening. Wow. One of the most emotional, wonderful nights of my life. Just incredible. And they, they had heard of Lemley their whole lives, but they didn't know his story. So that, that, was, that was extremely touching. That, that's probably, the greatest feeling I get out of doing these films is you're touching people in a way. And the, and the other thing is when I was doing the film festival circuit, four other families that nobody knew about that Carl Lindley had saved came forward and, and came up to me and said, he saved my grandmother. He saved my father. He saved my grandfather, you know, and it was like, Oh my God, you know? So it's pretty, pretty amazing stuff. I mean, nothing to do with me, just having to do with how great Carl Lundley was. That's, that's another great story. And Bryna, uh, for those who don't know, Bryna is a tremendous volunteer for the film festival, counting and, and leading the counting of all of the paper ballots. Uh, probably something else that will come into question next year, whether we're uh. <laughs> handling all the paper or not. Uh, but Bryna, thank you for, for that question and for always uh, supporting our festival. 
I don't know if, if Jess is still with us in New York, but I, I got to say bedtime stories with Uncle James is a lot of fun. <laughs> I was tapped into some really good ones. Uh, and she was little and I would go back east, I'd tell her. Well, that's a, that's a great experience. We'll have to ask you some questions about that later, Jess. Uh, but James, thank you so much for your time this evening. This is My this pleasure. Been... Thank you all for being here. You took my mind off the virus, and that's kind of a nice thing. Yeah, excellent. And as a reminder, Abby will throw some links up into, um, into the chat. Uh, a quick final question. Are Glickman's high school football games of the week archived anywhere? No, in fact that was recreated for the film they do not exist back then like I, I don't know like the tonight show like for the first seven years they they thought the tape was worth more than the shows so they re-recorded over the tapes over the shows well that's what they did you know the wpix high school football game of the week but i was able to find footage from exactly that era of those games they were home movies of that people shot and there is a chance that Marty actually might have been at one of those games doing that because I got, I got the footage from schools that I know he did broadcast in that era, in that time frame. But I was unable to get the broadcast because they don't exist. But you can't tell when you watch the film because <clears throat> he's, you know, he's still, uh, you know, it was really about what he did for high school people uh, like at halftime you'd have on the cheerleaders and the debate club and he just wanted to show the country that these kids are doing great stuff it wasn't just about the jocks he used that as a form the other thing that's crazy about that is that think about a major sports announcer like a Jim Nance or a Joe Buck or Bob Costas doing the high school game of the week you know and he was just doing you know being outside on a freezing cold New York day and he was just doing it because he loved sports. And, you know, his schedule was insane at that time. But he always made time for people. Carl Lindley was the same way. And it's, it's the thing that they both have in common, as you said, Ryan. I love – they're very hard to find. I won't always be able to do this. But to bring the stories of two, I feel, great men and uh, to the public that sort of slipped through the cracks of history on a certain level is, uh, you know, I, I'm honored to do that. I feel privileged to tell their story because it's, uh, we need a hell of a lot more people like these guys, especially now. Thanks, James. We're grateful that you're telling these stories. And I think we all look forward to the day when, when we can have you back in San Diego to, to learn about your next story. Okay. Trying, to, trying to read that whiteboard behind you, but I'm not gonna appear too closely. Oh, that's just festivals. Yeah. Well, <laughs> a lot of canceled right. well, th <laughs> thanks again James thank you everyone for joining us and uh, we'll see you all soon have a good evening and stay safe thank you thank you bye bye thanks Ryan thank you James okay take care bye bye